Chapter 9 Silver Spruce and Aspens The rest of that night seemed to Fenner's only a few moments of starlight, a dark overcasting of sky, an hour or so of great gloom, and then the lighting of dawn. When he bestirred himself, feeding the hungry dogs and breaking his long fast, and had repacked his saddlebags, it was clear daylight, so the sun had not tipped the yellow wall in the east. He concluded to make the climb and descent into Surprise Valley in one trip. To that end, he tied his blanket upon ring and gave Whitey the extra lasso and the rabbit to carry. Then, with the rifle and saddlebag slung upon his back, he took up the girl. She did not awaken from heavy slumber. That climb up under the rugged, menacing brows of the broken cliffs, in the face of a grim, leaning boulder that seemed to be weary of its age-long wavering, was a tax on strength and nerve that Venner's felt equally with something sweet and strangely exultant in its accomplishment. He did not pause until he gained the narrow divide, and there he rested. Balancing rock loomed huge, cold in the gray light of dawn, a thing without life. Yet it spoke silently to Venner's. I am waiting to plunge down, to shatter and crash, roar and boom, to bury your trail, and close forever the outlet to deception pass. On the descent of the other side, Venner's had easy going, but was somewhat concerned because Whitey appeared to have succumbed to temptation, and while carrying the rabbit was also chewing on it, and Ring evidently regarding this as an injury to himself, especially as he had carried the heavier load. Presently he snapped at one end of the rabbit and refused to let go, but his action prevented Whitey from further misdoing, and then the two dogs pattered down, carrying the rabbit between them. Venner's turned out of the gorge, and suddenly paused, stock still, astounded at the scene before him. The curve of the great stone bridge had caught the sunrise, and through the magnificent arch burst a glorious stream of gold that shone with a long slant down into the center of Surprise Valley. Only through the arch did any sunlight pass, so that all the rest of the valley lay still asleep, dark green, mysterious, shadowy, merging its level into the walls as misty and soft as morning clouds. Fenderson descended, passing through the arch, looking up at its tremendous height and sweep. It spanned the opening to Surprise Valley, stretching in almost perfect curve from rim to rim. Even in his hurry and concern, Fenners could not but feel its majesty, and the thought came to him that the cliff dwellers must have regarded it as an object of worship. Down, 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 Fenners strode, more and more feeling the weight of his burden as he descended, and still the valley lay below him. As all other canyons and coves of valleys had deceived him, so had this deep, nestling oval. At length he passed beyond the slope of weathered stone that spread fan-like from the arch, and encountered a grassy terrace running to the right and about on a level with the tips of the oaks and cottonwoods below. Scattered here and there upon this shelf were clumps of aspens, and he walked through them into a glade that surpassed the beauty and adaptability for a wild home. Any place he had ever seen, silver spruces bordered the base of a precipitous wall that rose loftily caves indented its surface, and there were no detached ledges or weathered sections that might dislodge a stone. The level ground beyond the spruces dropped down into a little ravine. This was one dense line of slender aspens from which came the low splashing of water, and the terrace, lying open to the west, afforded an unobstructed view of the valley of green treetops. For his camp, Fenris chose a shady, grassy plot between the silver spruces and the cliff. Here, in the stone wall, had been wonderfully carved by wind or washed by water, several deep caves above the level of the terrace. They were clean, dry, roomy. He cut spruce boughs and made a bed in the largest cave and laid the girl there. The first intimation he had of her being aroused from sleep or lethargy was a low call for water. He hurried down into the ravine with his canteen. It was a shallow, grass-green place with aspens growing up everywhere. To his delight, he found a tiny brook of swift running water. Its faint tinge of amber reminded him of the spring at Cottonwoods, and the thought gave him a little shock. The water was so cold, it made his fingers tingle as he dipped the canteen. Having returned to the cave, he was glad to see the girl drank thirstily. This time he noted that she could raise her head slightly without his help. You are thirsty, he said. It's good water. I've found a fine place. Tell me, how do you feel? There's pain here, she replied, and moved her hand to her left side. Why, that's strange. Your wounds are on your right side. I believe you're hungry. Is the pain kind of dull ache, a gnawing? It's like that. 
then its hunger, Bunner's laugh, and suddenly caught himself with a quick breath and felt again the little shock. When had he laughed? It's hunger, he went on. I've had that now many a time. I've got it now, but you mustn't eat. You can have all the water you want, but no food just yet. Won't I starve? No, people don't starve easily. I've discovered that. You must lie perfectly still and rest and sleep for days. My hands are dirty. My face feels so hot and sticky. My boots hurt. This was her longest speech as yet, and it trailed off in a whisper. Well, I'm a fine nurse. It annoyed him that he had never thought of these things, but then awaiting her death and thinking of her comfort were vastly different matters. He unwrapped the blanket which covered her. What a slender girl she was. No wonder he had been able to carry her for miles and pack her up that slippery ladder of stone. Her boots were of soft, fine leather, reaching clear to her knees. He recognized the make as the one of a bootmaker in Sterling. Her spurs, which he had stupidly neglected to remove, consisted of silver frames and gold chains. Large as silver dollars were fancifully engraved. The boots slipped off rather hard. She wore heavy woolen rider's stockings, half-length, and those were pulled up over the ends of her short trousers. Benners took off the stockings to note her little feet were red and swollen. He bathed them, then he removed his scarf and bathed her face and hands. I must see your wounds now, he said gently. She made no reply, but watched him steadily as he opened her blouse and untied the bandage. His strong fingers trembled a little as he removed it. If the wounds had reopened, a chill struck him as he saw the angry red bullet mark and a tiny stream of blood winding from it down her white breast. Very carefully, he lifted her to see that the wound in her back had closed perfectly. Then he washed the blood from her breast, bathed the wound, and left it unbandaged, open to the air. Her eyes thanked him. Listen, he said earnestly, I've had some wounds, and I've seen many. I know a little about them. The hole in your back is closed. If you lie still three days, the one in your breast will close, and you'll be safe. The danger from hemorrhage will be over. He had spoken with earnest sincerity, almost eagerness. Why? Do you want me to get well? she asked wonderingly. This simple question seemed unanswerable, except on grounds of humanity. But the circumstances under which he had shot this strange girl, the shock and realization, the waiting for death, the hope, had resulted in a condition of mind wherein Venner's wanted her to live more than he had ever wanted anything. Yet he could not tell why. He believed the killing of the wrestler and the subsequent excitement had disturbed him. For how else could he explain the throbbing in his brain, the heat of his blood, the undefined sense of full hours, charged, vibrant with pulsating mystery, where once they had dragged in loneliness? I shot you, he said slowly, and I want you to get well so I shall not have killed a woman, but for your own sake, too. A terrible bitterness darkened her eyes and her lips quivered. Hush, said Venners, you've talked too much already. In her unutterable bitterness, he saw a darkness of mood that could not have been caused by her present weak and feverish state. She hated the life she had led, and that she probably had been compelled to lead. She had suffered some unforgivable wrong at the hands of Oldring. With that conviction, Benners felt a shame throughout his body, and it marked rekindling of fierce anger and ruthlessness. In the past year, he had nursed resentment. He had hated the wilderness, the loneliness of the uplands. He had waited for something to come to pass. It had come. Like an Indian stealing horses, he had skulked into the recesses of the canyons. He had found Oldring's retreat. He had killed a rustler. He had shot an unfortunate girl, and then had saved her from this unwedding act. And he meant to save her from the consequent wasting of blood, from fever and weakness. Starvation he had to fight for her and for himself. Where he had been sick at the letting of blood, he now remembered it in grim, cold calm. And as he lost that softness of nature, so he lost his fear of men. He would watch for Oldring, biding his time, and he would kill this great black-bearded wrestler who had held this girl in bondage, who had used her to his own infamous ends. Fenner surmised as much of the change in him. Idleness had passed. Keen, fierce vigor flooded his mind and body. All that had happened to him at Cottonwood seemed remote and hard to recall. The difficulties and perils of the present absorbed him, held him in a kind of spell. First, then, he fitted up the little cave adjoining the girl's room for his own comfort and use. His next work was to build a fireplace of stones and to gather a store of wood. That done, he spilled the contents of his saddlebags upon the grass and took stock. 
His outfit consisted of a small handled axe, a hunting knife, a large number of cartridges for a rifle or revolver, a tin plate, a cup, a fork and spoon, a quantity of dried beef and dried fruits, and small canvas bags containing tea, sugar, salt, and pepper. For him alone, this supply would have been bountiful to begin a sojourn in the wilderness, but he was no longer alone. Starvation in the uplands was not an unheard of thing. He did not, however, worry at all on that score, and feared only his possible inability to supply the needs of a woman in a weakened and extremely delicate condition. If there was no game in the valley, a contingency he doubted, it would not be a great task for him to go out at night to Oldring's herd and pack out a calf. The exigency of the moment was to ascertain if there were game in Surprise Valley. Whitey still guarded the dilapidated rabbit, and Ring slept nearby under a spruce. Fenners called Ring and went to the edge of the terrace, and there halted to survey the valley. He was prepared to find it larger than his unsteady glances had made it appear. For more than a casual idea of dimensions and a hasty conception of overshape and singular beauty, he had not had time. Again, the felicity of the name he had given the valley struck him forcibly. Around the red perpendicular walls, except for the great arc of stone, ran a terrace fringed at the cliff base by silver spruces. Below that first terrace sloped another wider one more densely overgrown with aspens, and the center of the valley was a level circle of oaks and alders, with the glittering green lime of willows and cottonwoods dividing it in half. Venner saw a number and variety of birds flitting among the trees, to his left, facing the stone bridge, an enormous cavern opened in the wall, and low down, just above the treetops, he made out a long shelf of cliff dwellings with little black staring windows or doors, like eyes they were, and seemed to watch him. The few cliff dwellings he had seen, all ruins, had left him with haunting memory of age and solitude and something past. He had come, in a way, to be a cliff dweller himself, and those silent eyes would look down upon him as if in surprise after thousands of years a man had invaded the valley. Venners felt sure that he was the only white man who had ever walked under the window of the wonderful stone bridge. Down into that wonderful valley with its circle of caves and its terraced rings of silver spruce and aspens. The dogs growled below and rushed into the forest. Venners ran down the declivity to enter a zone of light shade streaked with sunshine. The oak trees were slender, none more than half a foot thick, and they grew close together, intermingling their branches. Ring came running back with a rabbit in his mouth. Fenners took the rabbit and, holding the dog near him, stole softly on. There were fluttering of wings among the branches in quick bird notes, and rustling of dead leaves and rapid patterings. Fenners crossed the well-worn trails marked with fresh tracks and when he had stolen on a little further, he saw many birds and running quail, and more rabbits than he could count. He had not penetrated the forest of oaks for a hundred yards, had not approached anywhere near the line of willows and cottonwoods, which he knew grew along a stream, but he had seen enough to know that Surprise Valley was the home of many wild creatures. Fenners returned to camp. He skinned the rabbits and gave the dogs one they had quarreled over, and the skin of this he dressed and hung up to dry, feeling that he would like to keep it. It was a particularly rich, furry pelt with a beautiful white tail. Fenners remembered that but for the bobbing of that white tail catching his eye, he would not have espied the rabbit, and he would not have discovered Surprise Valley. Little incidents of chance like this had turned him here and there in Deception Pass, and now they had assumed to him the significance and direction of destiny. His good fortune in the matter of game at hand brought to his mind the necessity of keeping it in the valley. Therefore he took an axe and cut bundles of aspen and willows, and packed them under the bridge to the narrow outlet of the gorge. Here he began fashioning a fence by driving aspens into the ground and lacing them fast with willows. Trip after trip he made down for more building material, and the afternoon had passed when he finished the work to his satisfaction. Wildcats might scale the fence, but no coyote could come in search for prey, and no rabbits or other small game could escape from the valley. Upon returning to camp, he sat about getting his supper at ease around a fine fire, without hurry or fear of discovery. After hard work that had definite purpose, this freedom and comfort gave him peculiar satisfaction. He caught himself often, as he kept busy around the campfire, stopping to glance at the quiet form in the cave and at the dogs stretched cozily near him and then out across the beautiful valley. The present was not yet real to him. While he ate, the sun set beyond a dip in the rim of the curved wall, 
as the morning sun burst wondrously through a grand arch in this valley in a golden slanting shaft so the evening sun at the moment of setting shone through a gap in the cliffs sending down a broad red burst to brighten the oval with a blaze of fire to venner's both sunrise and sunset were unreal a cool wind blew across the oval waving the tips of oaks and while the light lasted fluttering their aspen leaves into millions of faucets of red and sweeping the graceful spruces then with the wind soon came a shade and a darkening and suddenly the valley was gray night came there quickly after the sinking of the sun venner's went softly to look at the girl she slept and her breathing was quiet and slow he lifted ring into the cave with a stern whisper for him to stay there on guard then he drew a blanket carefully over her and returned to the campfire though exceedingly tired he was yet loath to yield to lassitude but this night it was not from listening watchful vigilance it was from a desire to realize his position the detail of his wild environment seemed the only substance of a strange dream he saw the darkening rims the gray oval turning black the undulating surface of forest like a rippling lake and the spear-pointed spruces he heard the flutter of aspen leaves and a soft continuous splash of falling water the melancholy note of a canyon bird broke clear and lonely from the high cliffs Venner's had no name for this night singer, and he had never seen one, but the few notes, always peeling out just at darkness, were as familiar to him as the cane in silence. Then they ceased, and the rustle of leaves and the murmur of water hushed, in a growing sound that Venner's fancied was not of earth. Neither had he a name for this, only it was inexpressibly wild and sweet. The thought came that it might be a moan from the girl in her last outcry of life, and he felt a tremor shake him. But no, this sound was not human, though it was like despair. He began to doubt his sensitive perceptions, to believe that he half dreamed what he thought he heard. Then the sound swelled with the strengthening of the breeze, and he realized it was the singing of the wind in the cliffs. By and by, drowsiness overcame him, and Venner's began to nod, half asleep with his back against a spruce. Rousing himself and calling Whitey, he went to the cave. The girl lay barely visible in the dimness. Ring crouched beside her, and the padding of his tail on the stone assured Venner's that the dog was awake and faithful to his duty. Venner sought his own bed of fragrant boughs, and as he lay back, somehow grateful for the comfort and safety, the night seemed to steal away from him, and he sank softly into intangible space and rest and slumber. Venner's wakened to the sound of melody that he imagined was only the haunting echo of dream music. He opened his eyes to another surprise of this valley of beautiful surprises. Out of his cave he saw the exquisite fine foliage of the silver spruces crossing a round space of blue morning sky. In this lacy leafage fluttered a number of gray birds with black and white stripes and long tails. They were mockingbirds, and they were singing as if they wanted to burst their throats. Venner's listened. One long silver-tipped branch dropped almost to his cave, and upon it, within a few yards of him, sat one of the graceful birds. Venner saw the swelling and quivering of his throat in song. He rose, and when he slid down out of his cave, the birds fluttered and flew further away. Venner stepped before the opening of the other cave and looked in. The girl was awake, with wide eyes and listening look, and shed a hand on Ring's neck. Mocking birds, she said. Yes, replied Venner's, and I believe they like our company. Where are we? Never mind now. After a little, I'll tell you. The birds woke me when I heard them and saw the shiny trees and the blue sky, and then a blaze of gold dropping down, I wondered. She did not complete her fancy, but Venner's imagined he understood her meaning. She appeared to be wondering in mind. Venner's felt her face and hands and found them burning with fever. He went for water and was glad to find it almost as cold as if flowing from ice. That water was the only medicine he had, and he put his faith in it. She did not want to drink, but he made her swallow, and then he bathed her face and hand and cooled her wrists. The day began with heightening of the fever. Venner spent the time reducing her temperature, cooling her hot cheeks and temples. He kept close watch over her, and at the least indication of restlessness that he knew led to tossing and rolling of the body, he held her tightly so no violent move could reopen her wounds. Hour after hour she babbled and laughed and cried and moaned in delirium, but whatever her secret was, she did not reveal it. Attended by something somber for Venner's, the day passed. At night, in the cool winds, the fever abated, and she slept. The second day was a repetition of the first. On the third, he seemed to see her wither and waste away before his eyes. That day, he scarcely went from her side for a moment, except to run for fresh, cool water, and he did not eat. The fever broke on the fourth day and left her spent and shrunken. 
the slip of a girl with life only in her eyes. They hung upon Venice with a mute observance, and he found hope in that. To rekindle the spark that had nearly flickered out, to nourish the little life and vitality that remained in her, was Venner's problem. But he had little resource other than the meat of the rabbits and quail, and from these he made broths and soups as best he could, and fed her with a spoon. It came to him that the human body, like the human soul, was a strange thing incapable of recovering from terrible shocks, for almost immediately she showed faint signs of gathering strength. There was one more waiting day, in which he doubted, and spent long hours by her side as she slept, and watched the gentle swell of her breast rise and fall in breathing, and the wind stir the tangled chestnut curls. On the next day he knew that she would live. Upon realizing it, he abruptly left the cave and sought his accustomed seat against the trunk of a big spruce, where once more he left his glance stray along the sloping terraces. She would live, and the somber gloom lifted out of the valley, and he felt relief that was pain. Then he roused to the call of action, to the many things he needed to do in the way of making camp fixtures and utensils, to the necessity of hunting food, and the desire to explore the valley. But he decided to wait a few more days before going far from camp, because he fancied that the girl rested easier when she could see him near at hand, and on the first day her languor appeared to leave her in a renewed grip of life. She awoke stronger from each short slumber. She ate greedily, and she moved about in her bed of boughs, and always, it seemed to Venner's, her eyes followed him. He knew now that her recovery would be rapid. She talked about the dogs, about the caves, the valley, and how hungry she was, till Venner silenced her, asking her to put off further talk till another time. She obeyed, but she sat up in her bed, and her eyes roved to and fro, and always back to him. Upon the second morning she sat up when he wakened her, and would not permit him to bathe her face and feed her, which actions she performed for herself. She spoke little, however, and Venice was quick to catch in her the first intimations of thoughtfulness and curiosity and appreciation of her situation. He left camp and took Whitey out to hunt for rabbits. Upon his return he was amazed and somewhat anxiously concerned to see his invalid sitting with her back to a corner of the cave and her bare feet swinging out. Hurriedly he approached, intending to advise her to lie down again, to tell her that perhaps she might overtax her strength. The sun shone upon her, gleaning on the little head with its tangle of bright hair and the small oval face with its pallor, and dark blue eyes underlined by dark blue circles. She looked at him and he looked at her. In that exchange of glances he imagined each saw the other in some different guise. It seemed impossible to Venice that this frail girl could be Oldring's masked rider, it flashed over him that he had made a mistake which presently she would explain. Help me down, she said. But are you well enough, he protested. Wait a little longer. I'm weak, dizzy, but I want to get down. He lifted her, what a light burden now, and stood her upright beside him and supported her as she essayed to walk with halting steps. She was like a stripling of a boy. The bright small head scarcely reached his shoulders. But now, as she clung to his arm, the rider's costume she wore did not contradict, as it had done at first, his feeling of her femininity. She might be the famous masked rider of the uplands, she might resemble a boy, but her outline, her little hands and feet, her hair, her big eyes and tremulous lips, and especially as something that Venner's felt as a subtle essence rather than what he saw proclaimed her sex. She soon tired. He arranged a comfortable seat for her under the spruce that overspread the campfire. Now, tell me everything, she said. He recounted all that had happened from the time of his discovery of the wrestlers in the canyon up to the present moment. You shot me, and now you are saved my life? Yes, after almost killing you, I pulled you through. Are you glad? I should say so. Her eyes were unusually expressive, and they regarded him steadily. She was unconscious of that mirroring of her emotions, and they shone with gratefulness and interest and wonder and sadness. Tell me about yourself, she asked. He made this a briefer story, telling her of his coming to Utah, his various occupations until he became a writer, and then how the Mormons had practically driven him out of Cottonwoods, an outcast. Then, no longer able to withstand his own burning curiosity, he questioned her in turn. Are you Olding's masked rider? Yes, she replied, and dropped her eyes. I knew it. I recognized your figure and mask, for I saw you once. Yet I can't believe it. But you were never really that wrestler, as we riders knew him, a thief, a marauder, a kidnapper of women, a murderer of sleeping riders. No, I never stole or harmed anyone in all my life. I only rode and rode.
But why? Why? he burst out. Why the name? I understand Oldring made you ride, but the black mask, the mystery, the things laid to your hands, the threats in your infamous name, the night riding credited to you, the evil deeds deliberately blamed on you and acknowledged by rustlers, even Oldring himself. Why? Tell me why. I never knew that, she answered low, her drooping head straightened, and the large eyes, larger now and darker, met Venner's with a clear, steadfast gaze in which he read truth. It verified his own conviction. Never knew? That's strange. Are you a Mormon? No. Is Oldring a Mormon? No. Do you care for him? Yes. I hate his men, his life. Sometimes I almost hate him. Venner's paused in his rapid-fire questioning, as if to brace himself to ask for a truth that would be abhorrent for him to confirm, but which he seemed driven to hear. What are, what were you to Oldring? Like some delicate thing suddenly exposed to blasting heat, the girl wielded. Her head dropped, and into her white, wasting cheeks crept the thread of shame. Venice would have given anything to recall that question. It seemed so different, his thoughts when spoken, yet her shame established in his mind something akin to the respect he had strangely been hungering to feel for her. Damn that question! Forget it! He cried in a passion of pain for her and anger at himself. But once and for all, tell me. I know it, yet I want to hear you say so. You couldn't help yourself? Oh, no. Well, that makes it all right with me, he went on honestly. I, I want you to feel that. You see, we've been thrown together, and— and I want to help you, not hurt you. I thought life had been cruel to me, but when I think of yours, I feel mean and little for my complaining. Anyway, I was a lonely outcast, but now I don't see very clearly what it all means. Only we are here together. We've got to stay here for long, surely till you are well. But you'll never go back to Oldring, and I'm sure helping you will help me, for I was sick in mind. There's something now for me to do, and if I can win back your strength and get you away out of this wild country— help you somehow to a happier life. Just think how good that'll be for me. End of chapter 9